afraid of being one of those like announcement things. But um, I know that we have <laughs> um, someone from our Deconstructing Racism team that will be leading the- um, Claudia. Claudia, thank you, I had forgotten. So Claudia will lead away. I hope you all have really great questions. And again, thank you so much, Peter, for your fabulous sermon and for being with us today. Yay, you! Claudia, take it away. Hey, who's uh, uh, Reverend Wang talked about loving our neighbors, living hyphenated lives as Asian Americans, that in order to love your all of your neighbors, you need to love all of yourself first. So who has questions for him about this or anything else he might have touched on? So feel free to unmute yourself, raise your hand on Zoom, or uh, type your question in the comments. Um, and go crazy. Peter can take it. The questions were not fed to me beforehand, just to let you know, right? <laughs> Peter, this is Anne Burdett. I'm an Anglo-American of indeterminate origin. Um, I so appreciate you bringing that question to the fore. Where are you from? Because um, it's one of those implicit biases and it's one of those microaggressions that those of us who do live in a bubble, thank you, Mackenzie, for describing it, um, need to share with others who say those things in our presence, but it doesn't register with them how hurtful it is. So I think we need to be courageous when we hear those questions, when our own family members use those terms. Um, I think that's a really important um, stand to take. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Anna. This is Patricia. There's such a difference um, between the in the experience of white folks as opposed to POC. It's kind of a, for me as a an, as an Ameri a white American. Um, it's kind of charming, and I have the the fun and the privilege of presenting myself as Irish American if I like it. And we all do, you know. We kind of my roots are Scandinavian or whatever they are, and that's a fun part of who we are. There's nothing challenging about it or negative, or it has a whole different tone than when you ask black people or, or, or colored people what their background is. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, I think just to respond to that, um, Patricia, that uh, sometimes that initial um, sort of rehyphenization is potentially uh, an, uh, uh, a start to another conversation. So, you know, to be able to say, for someone to say, you know, I'm Italian American, yet we were not incarcerated in, in World War II as Japanese Americans are, you know, and it's, it's, it's a way to have those conversations that um, allow for these new spaces to happen that will acknowledge uh, what has happened in history and what's still going on um, in these days. And so um, language is often so powerful, you know, just the, the things that we assume um, just makes us really mindful of what we say. You know, even today's um, um, epistle reading, the whole contrast with black, you know, darkness and light, you know, and the implicit biases that sometimes even our language um, creates, you know, that white is good and darkness and dark skin is bad, you know, so we, it, this is just part of it is a call for us to, to be mindful of that. Um, I'm interested in how you acknowledged the bias that you had against certain Asian people. Oh, yeah, we have, <laughs> we have our own sort of hierarchy, pecking order, and a lot of it has been uh, products of the, uh, imperialism and colonialism. And so uh, the Western world is not the only colonizer and um, you know, empire. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. we need to acknowledge that among ourselves too. So um, Reverend, this is Ramon. And when, when somebody asks me, 
the question, how am I going to redirect it to be like rather than answering, well, I'm from the Philippines, rather than how, how am I going to respond to, to teach them how to phrase it correctly, not necessarily to know where I came from, because I'm here, I'm an American citizen. Yeah. And so, you know, you don't want to be as smart by saying, well, I'm an American, but obviously, you know, they will say, no, you're not, you're not from here. You're not born here. And that is the very usual response that you will get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ramon. And, and uh, congratulations too <laughs> for you too. Um, the, that question is loaded and part, part of it is just acknowledging that, right? Because I, I think I work with um, many first gener generation folks who um, recently immigrated. And when you ask them the question, where are you from? They would proudly say Thailand or Indonesia, yeah. you know, because that, that is uh, what they claim as their identity. Um, the question is loaded because it really points to where home is and where belonging is. Oh, you know? it is. Um, oftentimes I think it is um, asking about where the question is coming from, you know, uh, if the question uh, asker is interested, you know, so sometimes it is um, um, disarming that a little bit and say, yeah, I, I'd love to answer that question. I'm curious um, what, you're, what you're wanting to know, you know, and if they say, yeah, I wanted to know where your ancestors are from. Oh, okay. So that's, that's the question, huh? So let me answer that. And uh, I can then ask back, where are your ancestors from? Uh, but sometimes if they keep persisting and saying, no, 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 where are you from? Where are you from? And it is this sort of invalidating question. Then we want to, we want to catch that. Uh, I was in a conversation with, uh, at another Episcopal church, which I will not name. And uh, someone came up and asked me that same question. Um, where are you from? And they had heard that I was from Japan and I, you know, part, part, of, part Japanese. And I said, Japan. And he immediately just went to, oh, I love sushi. And uh, I have neighbors who are Japanese. And then I probed a little bit. I said, are they Japanese or Japanese American? You know, it turned out that he really wasn't interested in, in conversation. He just wanted to use that as a way to talk about his own experience with Japanese people. So I flipped a question at him. I said, so um, where are you from? And then I know that his last name had, Italian, had a sort of Italian name. And he said, well, I'm from Burbank. And I said, well, no, where are you really from? And then he said, oh, you mean where my ancestors are from? They're from Italy. And I just turned to him, I looked at him and I said, I love pasta. <laughs> I love spaghetti with meatballs. <laughs> and um, I was just being snarky. I wasn't my best self, but I just couldn't you resist, you know. And he was taken aback and he was, a bit shocked, like, huh, like almost offended. And I said, that's sometimes how I feel. Hmm. You know, not my best self, because of course we want to build deep solidarity. And, um, but that's just an example. I think Arlene has a question. I have an observation about, uh, in this whole conversation about the him. I noticed right away, because I love that hymn so much, the change in that chorus. And Nancy has sent a chat that says, that's the reason we change it to change it from in him there is no darkness at all to um, in God there are no shadows. Um, and that reminds me of something um, from when my daughter was in um, elementary school, second or third grade the um, teacher had a, um, a way of awarding the students for good behavior. It was color coded, but if they were, were um, behaving in an unacceptable manner, the color was black. And if they, you know, it, it, it um, went down the colors spectrum, but bad meant black. And my husband, her father, my husband at the time, he marched down to the school and said, this is so wrong. 
to equate black with bad or black with wrong. And the teacher was receptive to it and she changed the color coding so that um, the bad behavior was red, more like a, 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 a traffic signal, that kind of spectrum. But just, it's, it is important to make a distinction between dark and shadows. I appreciate that with the hymn today. Diane, I think you have a question as well. I wanted to actually um, just express appreciation for that nuance of how people of color also, um, while we cannot be racist because we are the minority, we can definitely be very prejudiced. And growing up in the South, I being half white, I came into school speaking English only at first, and um, I did well in school, and so I was always treated very well amongst my um, other students who were, um, a lot of them were immigrants or, or migrant workers, family, you know, children of migrant workers. So they didn't all come into school speaking English right off the bat. Um, some of them weren't going to be around the whole school year. But uh, it's been interesting to me how moving in circles, it, I mean, I had that in my family where I remember I was going to move uh, away with to one of my aunt's house and my uncle said, just make sure you don't start loving jungle bunnies too, because my aunt was married to a black man. And it was just always strange to me that my Mexican family was so willing to accept me into the family because I was half I was half white. Nobody ever brought that up in a mean or derogatory way. But then my cousin, who was half black, she felt not a part of our family for the longest time. Um, and I didn't realize that, but she said she even felt that from some of our cousins. And that was just so disheartening to me that right there within our own family, we had that same type of treatment of one another and we're minorities. So it, it, for me, it's extra um, upsetting when we do it. Um, and we're, you know, as Latinos, we're more concerned with our Spanish roots than we are our indigenous roots. And so I just, I really appreciate that you pointed that out um, within the Asian community as well. So thank you for that. It makes the problem seem so intractable that it's not only between whites and people of color, but within every category of people of color. Well, I would say that's because that's how truly ingrained our racism is in this country. It is part of the air we breathe and the water we drink. And to the point where those of us who have been part of the oppressed, we become oppressors too. Because it's better to kick somebody else down and get a leg up than you be part of the excluded one. So if you can pass and fit in, yeah, it's a hard. I like the book, The Vanishing Half. The Vanishing Half. That's a wonderful book. I'm looking at the. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm looking at the time, and I would really like um, Peter. Can you talk a little bit about the work that the gathering is doing, um, especially this the the last um, webinars that you've had? Um, there was this great conversation around capitalism and racism, um, and racial identity. So if you could share a little bit in some of the upcoming webinars, so people know that's coming up, that would be great. Thank you. I'd uh, be glad to do that. Um, and first, Nancy, just answering that question, you know, understanding and deconstructing racism is, is, is uh, so complex, you know, and so uh, a lot of what I talked about today and uh, what my work to do is uh, focused around a lot of it is on racial identity and, uh, you know, how do we see ourselves and then how do we then engage in others, you know. Um, a lot of our work we hope to do is also to uh, deconstruct racism at a much more systemic level, and which is what something like racial capitalism, understanding that um, really sheds a different kind of light, which is, you know, what are some of the oppressive systems that are in place that actually go hand in hand or even nurture or grow these um, 
prejudices or, or racial, racial attitudes. You know, I didn't get to talk today about redlining, you know, and you probably have heard that from some of your speakers. Who gets to be your neighbor? Because who's allowed to buy a home in your neighborhood? You know, um, Monterey Park is not over 60% Asian for, you know, no reason because most Asian Americans and Black Americans were uh, confined to Crenshaw District and uh, South you know, West Adams, you know, in the 40s and 50s. And Monterey Park was one of the first cities um, to open up for Asian American home ownership, you know, and then the, the growth went uh, uh, eastward. And so those things are getting talked about. This is a, a, a what Nancy is referring to is this uh, diocesan series on uh, trauma and untruths. It's put on by the uh, new community, which is the, the people of color ministry, um, wanting to talk about uh, what the different ways of understanding racism um, are. And so um, let me see if I can find some information uh, and then send that your way. But it's a series of webinars that will focus on racial identity, uh, racial capitalism and um, the doctrine of discovery, which is uh, the, the, the reason for sort of colonizing the, um, the indigenous people uh, here in the US. Uh, the gathering was formed in uh, 2017 and we are a uh, diocesan ministry that uh, wants to create a space for uh, um, Asian Pacific Americans. And I say Asian Pacific Americans because oftentimes it's not, you know, uh, we're not just Asian Americans, but also for, uh, Pacific Islanders. And um, we have events. Um, we, we create a space for uh, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders to tell their stories. And a lot of actually white allies uh, come to our events and other people of color because through our storytelling, uh, there's a sense of solidarity. These are some of the stories that we share together, uh, not just uh, stories of oppression and pain, but also of joy and of resilience and of faith. And um, so I invite, invite all of you um, to our events. Our next event is actually um, uh, September 19th. So it's in a couple of weeks. Um, and the, the topic is why Black Lives Matter to Asian Pacific Americans. Mm -hmm. And we'll specifically talk about uh, anti-Blackness in the Asian Pacific American community, as well as history of working together. Um, the, um, um, we have a, a group of panelists. Um, Susan, uh, Suzanne uh, Edwards Acton is, uh, will actually be one of our panelists, as well as a, um, a Chinese American professor who teaches at Howard University. And so we have a good, good mix of people. Um, let, me, uh, let me type, up, uh, type in the website. There you go. Um, and so you'll see, you'll see these uh, events listed uh, on the events page of our website. Um, but it's been a great place um, for um, Asian Pacific Americans to get together. Um, find solidarity, but also do more. Uh, this isn't just about feeling good about having a space for ourselves, but we want to be mobilized for change. Nancy, do we have time for a few more questions? Yes. Uh, Ramon, you had your hand up, and then I believe Byron also had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, my, my question is, um, I think, um, our, I think it's not a question, but it's more a comment. From my observation is that I think racism is also very part in our community, especially in the Filipino community. There's so much um, class system that we have, and it will going to determine which class you belong to. Mm -hmm. And I think it should start in our own community. Maybe that will going to teach us all, you know, first in our own community before we go out and, and say, you know, to white people or something like that about that. What, what, do, you, what do you think about that? 
Mm. Um, I think there's a matter of both. You know, uh, the deep, the internal work is important because it, it deepens uh, whatever connection get, uh, get built so that well, we're not just paying lip service, but we're really the, the deep knowing and loving of ourselves is a way of then uh, what is what we then bring to new relationships, new dynamics. Unfortunately, um, you know, racism is the sin of our country. It's it's been since, um, uh, and I mean, and when I say the country, I mean the United States of America, because you know, North America has been many nations before the colonizers set in. You know, but it is it is. It is the sin of our nation, and um, the work, the larger work, um, it's it's never too late, never too urgent to to work on. And so, uh, changing things uh, systemically, um, um, being you know having that voice uh, to advocate for change systemically, that work is we it's been waiting to be done for a long, long time. I mean, and, and I say this also um, to note that it has been done. So this isn't just a 2000, you know, 2020 thing. Um, you know, we as Asian Americans, we stand on the shoulders of the civil, you know, the civil rights movement. You know, um, when, I, when I come across, uh, especially new immigrants uh, that say, why, what's, What's BLM? Why do, what's this whole thing about Black Lives Matter? Why, why is that important to us? Um, we have a conversation and I, and I talk about um, the, that we benefit from uh, the changes that have come out from the, the civil rights movement. And we stand on the shoulders of, of black and brown um, civil rights leaders. You know, we can't take those things for granted. So what the work has already been happening, but what we're seeing right now, even more so, it is so necessary. Uh, and for Christians, uh, this notion, it's in our baptismal covenant. Um, this is who we are. And uh, I, I take it to heart that um, it's not just an American thing. It, it is, it's, we're, we're moved as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to want that. And um, that's what motivates me. Aaron, do you have a question? I don't want to get too lengthy here, but uh, I don't even know how to say it. Is it. Most of you know, and we are, we are we're fairly well progressed in understanding black things, okay, the racial things in that area. But when we moved to California, I suddenly realized that I had these sort of, un, you know, unfamiliar and unconditioned responses to people that I didn't know, to uh, Latinos. I didn't know very many Latinos. I didn't know, I didn't know many Asians. I didn't know many gay people. And uh, it was kind of, shocking to me that I wasn't squared away in those areas, you know, when I got out here that I had work to do to try to, you know, meet people and, and, and know people and so forth. And probably the last group that we, that I have, have encountered is I still don't know many Asians. I know Ramon and, I, you know, and, and some other people, but I don't, <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I, I don't, uh, you know, it's just that there's work to do, and I, 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 one has to be aware, and I'm not saying this is a virtue, that you aren't done. You know, even as, as uh, you were speaking about, you know, asking, the, the thing, I, I, you said things and I cringed because I know that I probably said those things, you know, and, and uh, it's just, you know, and I, and I cringe now at the future things of somebody I'm going to meet in the future of some that, who's different from me that I'm going to miss, you know, miss uh, place. But I, you know, I guess I'm saying that a little of it goes along with unfamiliarity. And I think we have, it's up to us to have to try to, you know, make contact and, and, and solve that for ourselves by, by familiarity with people. 
I, I was thinking of when Byron was in graduate school in Montana 50 years ago, mm -hmm. he had a, a fellow student named Harry Hahn, who was from San Francisco. And when people- No, he would, was from Montana. He was from Montana. He was from Montana. And people would say, well, where are you from? Where are you really from? And he'd say, Montana. <laughs> and then somebody would say, well, where are your parents from? He would say, San Francisco. And he just kept doing that and kept doing it. It just occurred to me as you were talking that his <clears throat> grandchildren in Montana are probably still being asked that question and yeah. we're probably fifth generation in by now. So mm -hmm. is there a movement to get the hyphenated out? This is kind of a new conception to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm delighted that you're talking about it, but where are we on it? Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for these comments. Um, the hyphen is, let me think about how to, it's, there's, there's, um, there's a complexity to it because on one hand, the, the hyphen, um, the hyphen qualifies us. Yeah. And so we, we don't like to hyphen, you know, when, so when there are conversations about who is American, the hyphen qualifies that. Now, at the same time, um, we, I, I think most people of color would cringe at this notion of, I don't see color, right? And so everyone is American, everyone is God's children. And so the hyphen is sometimes necessary. So it's, it's a both and. So we talk about the hyphen with the hyphen um, with pride. Um, but we also know that it's a marker for um, being um, on the margins. Uh, but I think that's the com complex world that we live in. So, so it's not necessary, like I said, you know, where are you from? It's, uh, can we get to know each other? You know, so that the hyphen likely is, is on both sides of the conversation. Um, but we often don't assume that. And when the, when the hyphen is dropped on one side, then that's when we begin to um, propagate um, these um, assumptions. You know that some people belong and other people uh, other people don't. Um, I think um, that you that you cringe at some of the things that I said is actually a good thing. Makes me hopeful, actually, right? Because it means that it's uncomfortable, and it means that uh, that was worth saying, you know. And that uh, when I, but as I was preparing for this and getting to know um, a little bit about St. Luke's and experiencing you this morning, I, I am so hopeful. Um, the liturgy, um, how that's put together with the music and the, the messages and wow, that my Angelou um, song, the, the poem. And uh, I was just really moved. And, and for me, that's, that's hopeful that as many of you are engaged in my work to do and that you're doing this series, that's tremendously hopeful to me. So thank you. Um, thank you for that. What other questions do you have? Well, actually, I'm sorry, but we need to start getting ready for our 1230 Spanish service. Okay. <laughs> but um, I, I do, I, once again, I want to thank Peter for just being with us for that sermon, for this Q&A, um, and for those last words of, of finding the hope. Sometimes it's so hard to find hope. And just a reminder that at St. Luke's, we're doing amazing things, amazing work in our in our church and in our community, and we will continue to do that work because that is God's work. So thank you all for sticking around. Next Sunday, we will have another guest preacher and another time for Q&A. Any questions you may still have for Peter, um, shoot him an email, he's fabulous. Um, and obviously you can always email both Jane and myself and we can try to get you, your, get you an answer. But thank you again for sticking around and and joining us as we continue on this um, on this series. And it's not going to stop now. This is not just a phase. We are going to continue on this work for a long time. <laughs> <laughs>
So again, gracias. Nos vemos el domingo que viene. And yay, Peter. Thank yay. you. Peter.